Hey, it's the Deer Wizard, host of North American Deer Talk. I want to tell you about a great new advertising and research platform that we've developed for you, CWDbreeding.com. You know, as the deer industry continues to mature and develop around chronic waste and disease and its known genetic heritability, resources like CWDbreeding.com become essential tools for deer managers across the country making decisions about their herds. I really wanted a platform that excelled at hosting GEBV and codon markers in a filterable and searchable manner, but I also wanted to have high quality pictures, videos, ages, scores, NADAR numbers, and a whole host of other information to go along with that. This database puts everything in one easy to find location and allows you to access the industry's greatest genetic resources. I look forward to seeing all the great bucks that people have to offer in one easy to find location, cwdbreeding.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of North American Deer Talk. This is episode 100. And just in case you were wondering, uh, we have a group hangout going on today. And this is a hundred years of experience. I think we have that all together here on the screen today. Uh, we got Mr. Yep, we got Mr. Dan yep. Jennings from New York. We have we have uh, Jared Berry from uh, Pennsylvania. I'm certainly not going to call him Mr. And we have Mr. Frederick C. Hubner from Iowa. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today for this hundredth episode of North American Deer Talk. Well, thank you. Yeah, don't worry about the other two guys, Fred. They they don't want to say anything nice. Um, well, okay, we're so Fred first, we're getting the respect is, is yes, is due. age Fred's before everything. Years came from. <laughs> um, I just want to take care of a little housekeeping before we get going. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. If you are not a YouTube fan, we do it over at Rumble as well. If you're listening on the podcast, thank you so much. We are on all your favorite platforms from Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, and so forth. Um, guys, I really appreciate you coming on today and, and joining me. It's, uh, I started this podcast up in uh, 2015. I think Fred was my, I want to say my second interview that we did. And and a little funny story behind that is Fred and I sat down. We were in, I think we were at like uh, maybe Midwest Select or something like that. One of the, the gone and defunct sales. And we were in my hotel room sitting across from each other. We did like a two hour bender. We got done. I looked over at Fred and was like, yeah, I forgot to hit the record button. Can we do that again? And we sat down and we did it again. Uh, pretty, pretty funny. The, uh, the early days. Now we have this fine technology where we can all just hop on the, uh, the computer, but anyway, you guys have all been guests. I appreciate you coming on. Um, I'm going to start with Fred again, age before everything else, Fred, you got, uh, 42 years in the business coming up on, on 43 here this spring. Um, I guess looking back, how does, how does like, forget about the time, but like, it, it can't be discounted how long you've been in the industry and, and there's so many things that you've seen. How, like, g give us just a recap of what that looks like, just uh, on a chronological timeline or something like that. I mean, Fred, you were raising deer before I was born. Yeah, I know. It, <laughs> it, it, it's almost like, um, you know, farming in the United States, we go clear back to, you know, horse drawn, uh, horse drawn equipment and, you know, and then up to now it's all computerized and, and all that, you know, there's just that many changes that have happened. Um, so yeah, back when I started, n no regulations, uh, movement in and out of any state, no healthcare requirements, CWD wasn't heard of. Um, you just catch the deer and take it home, you know, um, it's, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy. When I was young, really young, the first, first buck I ever bought, uh, I bought at an auction. The deer used to go to an auction, you know, where you just take them home. And I bought a deer and the line to load out was too long. So I climbed over a fence, grabbed him, carried him over the fence out to the car and put him in a box stall. I, mean, I was pretty stout back when I was a kid. So, but that's how things have changed. You know, to, to today, it's permits and week long looking into y your herd's background, your CWD status, how close CWD is to your farm, 
you know, you see being brucellosis status, it's just, it's just completely different. And, and in all those years, you've had people drop out because they didn't want to put up with the regulations. And, and I guess that's, that's where I've just stuck around so, so, so long. Cause I figured out I can live with regulations as, you know, as I can adapt, you know, and persevere. Fred, Josh, can I ask a question? Uh, Fred, no, when you Jerry. got started and you may have mentioned this in the past, um, was there a purpose outside of a hobby for you getting started? I don't, I don't know if I know that answer. Mm -hmm. No, back back then, um, uh, hobby, yeah, just uh, exotics, exotics, you know, something different. Um, no real hunting market. I mean, there was a few ranches. Um, of course, the prices on hunt bucks was was out of whack. Um, There's a fellow in Ohio would come out to the Midwest. Uh, we always called him Chevy Bob. I don't know exactly where he came from, but if there was a well, that's what he was called. If there was a buck that was 170 inches, mm. it's $25,000 easy, you know, and he'd be the guy to buy it. Um, and then you go, you know, you, you go clear back then, you we had no technology either. There was no way to advertise. We had the animal finders guide, and that's where deer folks advertised that they were raising deer or, or had anything anything for sale. Otherwise, it was pretty local. You were selling to guys pretty local. And it took, you know, it took some substantial travel to build your market, you know, back in the, that would have back, back in the nineties, you know? So, I mean, you just had to drive a long way and look at all kinds of people's deer before you, they figured out maybe they'd want some of yours. So that's, that's it's, what I used to do. Freddie, what, what got you into deer? What was the, like, what made you? So, so, um, I got my first deer when I was, uh, uh, after my freshman year in college and a buddy of mine in college, we were in a band together and he was raising uh, exotic animals and I've always raised animals, but it reminded me of a good memory I had as a kid, about seven years old, going to Clarksville, Iowa and bottle feeding fawns. And it's like, shit, I can do that. You know, I had, I had room and, and, you know, raised all kinds of stuff. And, and, and back then fawns were either $75 for bucks and the, and the most you would pay is 250. So everything was bottle fed every, you know, everybody had bottle fed tame deer, no working facilities. The drugs we had back then were, you might as well roped them as, as good as the tranquilizers were, you know, um, the romp them days. Oh, it was, just, it was, yeah, rodeo. The, the, there was no formulated feed for deer. You kind of had to make up your own stuff. It was back then it was tough to keep uh, whitetails in good condition because no one knew the vitamins and, and mineral ratios that they had to have to keep them in in good condition so yeah it was fred's it, fred it, still feeding the same thing he fed in 1983 1992 for sure 1992 nice <laughs> yeah. now i always give fred a hard time because uh i went out there and and looked at his feed and from a purely visual perspective um you'd give him a hard time too so uh, yeah I didn't. I didn't ask if you cared, Fred. I. I. I can. I can see that. I can. See it is that. what it is, boys. It is what it is. Yeah. It, um, it does okay. I. Uh, how was? Because um, I remember over here in PA. I remember. Like. I've heard plenty of stories about guys grabbing animals out of fields and, you know, just doing all sorts of stuff. But I remember our game commission had rehab programs and like that's how a lot of guys got into raising deer is like game commission to drop a fawn off at their place and these weren't like you could buy like a menagerie permit or whatever the heck you had to have and like that's how a ton of the stuff got started over here i mean penn state's whole herd at their facility was built on pa wild deer and i suspect you know probably new york border you know uh virginia maryland and, and ohio 
um, all those animals came out of the wild. I can tell you, Iowa, there, there's two fellas, two fellas I know way back, way back when that the back part of their back part of their fence along the trees, there was a ramp coming up to the fence built with dirt and they'd have bucks jump in and breed the does. And so one wild. guy bred with uh, wild 200 inch bucks, probably three years in a row. And his deer were just tremendous. Um, Josh, you would know that's where I got Sasha from. Mm. Is that is that herd of um, where the guy just had bucks just jump in, breed? He'd open the gate, let them loose, you know, just but let them in every let them let them come over the fence every fall. So, yeah. so you guys heard you know Fred touch on that regulatory component of of or the lack thereof of of back in the day. Um, do you guys think that the industry would? be where it is today from a genetic standpoint without some of that regulation? Like, does the regu, does the regu, I'll say it, I'll say it differently. Does the regulation provide um, an environment for a more serious operation to exist? Like you say, look, like there's, because I don't know of any industry that doesn't have some sort of regulation. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying it is. And there is a cost barrier to that regulation, um, whether it be monetarily or or even from a, you know, a, maybe an emotional standpoint. Like, you know, Fred, Freddie mentioned, you know, some guys just didn't want to deal with the regulation. Well, that obviously was a tax on them. And I don't mean, a, again, not a, not a monetary tax but a an emotional one or a, um one that existed uh in their 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 lives that they didn't want D do you think without that the industry would be where it is today one thing that happened with all the regulation we used to be a bunch of cowboys okay with with our guns and and we'd go out and dart deer that's the only thing we knew knew how to do and with regulations working facilities, learning how to work deer, handle deer, understand the, the, uh, you know, what deer do when they're caught in pens and how you have to build stuff to keep them alive. That's one thing that really changed through the years, you know, um, you know, in Griffith out there in PA, they might've had one of the first shoots. There were some guys in Indiana building the first deer shoot. And then we had the Canadian come down with, with the green shoots. But that's the one thing I saw that changed the most is guys were not just building pens, but they were building pens with a way to eventually get into a work facility. And, and then with that, <clears throat> then came on the ability to artificial inseminate, you know, collect bucks, breed does. And, and yes, then that's what I saw or what I would say changed our breeding side of things is that that ability to freeze semen and work the does through the shoot you know and you know started out with you know vaginal ai and actually bring in new genetics to your herd without having to pay gosh guys bucks back then were hundreds of thousands of dollars you know to buy and you could buy semen for let's say 900 to 1500 dollars out of the same buck so I, I think that's part of, you know, having the TB test, brucellosis test, build those facilities also change us into a more advanced um, reproductive uh, industry. You know, we looked at what was available. I want to tell all the folks listening, which is, this is just terrible, but the other three guys have all bred with the A-team. And I don't know why they would do that. I, I don't know how we got on here together, but I just I couldn't sleep last night just thinking about this. It's like, oh, them poor devils have been screwed over by Fred, and I'm so happy. I'm so happy we, about that. Fred, and 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 uh, to that point, which I think is is worthwhile noting, we're going to have a segment in the show called Talk Your Book, so you'll be able to uh, speak about the A-team uh, further at that point. We're going to do lightning round uh, questions, so... I think you'll enjoy that a bunch. 
All right, good, good. I'm glad the commentary is, is, is full here. Uh, speaking of Griffith shoots, I think Jared still has one of those in his facility. I do still have one. And, he lo- and he lo- you love it, right? I do love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I love it. I just haven't – I've been too cheap to uh, replace it <laughs> as well. No, but it's well, – I, like, I still have one. That thing's – that thing's you know, t- the, the design anyway is t- 25, 30 years old now. I mean, it just – the fact that it still is relevant today kind of – speaks to how how good it is and and how well designed um which i think is cool um so i want to i want to shift gears because we we started getting into some things um i'm curious to know uh jared and i are pretty much relatively speaking in the same area fred you're obviously out in the midwest uh and dan's in new york curious what you guys think about this uh this weather or this winter uh weather um if you think it has positive or negative effects on your animals in its current state. Dan, why don't you start? Yeah, I mean, I everybody likes the warmer weather, but I don't like it in the fact of farming and livestock. You know, I, I like to have some snow. I like to have some cold temperatures and I like to have some stability. You know, I don't like the big fluctuations, you know, big fluctuations and, and, and temperatures. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd really like to have some snow on the ground, help, you know, keep the pens a little cleaner, get away from the mud, you know, uh, it's a little easier on the machinery, you know, with the hunting ranch and stuff, you're, you know, you're driving through mud puddles during the day and then things are freezing at night and it's just, you know, it's tough on your equipment, it's tough on your animals, it's tough on your staff. And, uh, so I'd like to just get into winter. I'd like it to be a, a, a solid winter. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're, I mean, it's 37 degrees here right now. A couple of days ago, it was almost 70, uh, and it's February. So I'd like to, I like the winters. I like the four seasons personally. Uh, I think it's better. I think it's better for farming and everyone likes snow, you know, the poor man's fertilizer. Um, so yeah. What's, what's everybody else think? Yeah. I, I was thinking about this the other day. Cause I, Josh, I know we probably beat the, uh, beat the heck out of the discussion of density. Um, but it, again, it just changed it's for me it just changes or makes me think about the management of the farm like on a daily basis this isn't the first winter it's been warm it's it's a it's a trending thing at least here in the northeast where we're having warmer winters and um i don't like mud so it's adapting to management to try to not have any mud and have ground cover all year long becomes more difficult but um i i, I still have good ground cover and that to me, that's just managing the density and the pen rotations, et cetera. I mean, there's there's a balance between having enough deer to make a living and not having enough deer to do that. But um, it certainly is a challenge to um, to deal with as far as far as the warm weather, the soft ground. Um, we've been fortunate to 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 have the pens stay intact pretty good, but it's 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 a pain. You know, you limit what you can do like dan said on the ranch th- there's a lot of our main roads i don't even want people on them this time of year because it just there's so much work that comes in the spring and summer to repair ruts to all all that comes along with that soft ground um but from a deer perspective for me um it's been managing my densities and how much impact them those pens are getting especially during weather like this um i i i in my mind, I try to refuse to have any bare ground in my pens, which is a challenge, but um, it's even more of a challenge when we have weather like this, when you don't get the frozen ground, you know, um, it's, it's, it's hard on your animals, but um, it, it's, we have to deal with it. So you got to figure out how to manage with it, in my opinion. Fred, tell us about snow drifts. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, uh, it, it really is, it's not that enjoyable to get older, okay? Because um, we had snow drifts over eight foot high out here. Um, when we did have the snow, like the 11th or 10th, 11th, 12th of January, temperatures were down to minus, minus 30. But before that, we got 34, 36 inches of snow. And so then the wind kicked up and um 
I didn't get out of the house for five days. There was no place to go. There was no place to go. I mean, I got out and I plowed snow on this end of the yard and I'd start the driveway and couldn't get it done before I got so cold. I couldn't stand it and had a neighbor come and yeah, five days to get out. Um, the, the deer, um, they got hay thrown over top of the fence. I thought that was good enough. I couldn't get the gates open to put in um, their, their feed ration. But um, like you guys, it never, you know, we got all that snow and then it got cold, never froze the ground. We haven't had enough frost to say we, to say we did. You know, the ponds have already been open for a month. Um, you know, the Canadian, the Canadian geese left let's say, let's say like January 3rd, and they've been back for a month already. They just, you know, they didn't go anywhere. They're already back. So, um, yeah, I like that good hard frost. You know, it uh, takes care of a lot of uh, parasite load on the ground. It uh, loosens the ground up again, gets it ready. If you're going to reseed in the spring, gets it ready to work. Um, I guess, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, maybe I don't have enough deer, but but um my pens are green all winter you know the buck fawns out there they've ate a bunch of their grass down but it's growing now every once in a while and it's green and um you know i got mule deer in a pen that i leave the grass pretty long so it's more like what they're used to out in the out in the out in the west you know and they've got that half eaten down you know they'd rather eat that crap than than the feed or the or or the hay you know the alfalfa hay i give them they're out there eating on them dry stems so um that's the other thing that we need to keep in mind is you know deer's metabolism shuts down in the winter time they don't need they don't need all the protein all the care that that we try to give them constantly you know their metabolism just says oh, we're gonna sit here and give me some hay and i'll burn that all day um so yeah there's at one time uh, there was seven years I never watered the deer in the wintertime because I had snow all the time. And if they had fresh snow on the ground, deer could eat enough snow to stay hydrated. Now, larger animals can't. Cattle can't do that. But but deer are able to do that, which is another wonderful thing about the animal. Yeah, it's, it's interesting just to I, I, follow up on some of Jared's comments. Um, it was, I think it was... Uh, I want to say it was like 2019. I think it was 2019. And we had, I don't know if we had 10 inches of snow cumulatively all winter. And I just remember my, my pens just got destroyed and I had to, I had too many animals because I was just coming out of two years of quarantine and I wasn't able to, to move anything at that time. And I just remember walking out, collecting antlers. I got a video of my, my daughter at the time trying to shuffle some of these bigger two-year-olds that I had to keep and picking these antlers up. And I, I watched that video and I was like, Oh my gosh, like just barren. Right. And like, now I look out and you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot more grass, but they still do take a toll. The, the pens that is, and, and it requires at least a, at my place requires some overseeding and, and such. But I think it, you know, when you, when you look at, when you look at the the industry generally, I think we could we could all agree that in some capacity, uh, we would think that many people have too many deer uh, per specific piece of ground, and like in the in the planning stages, I'm always trying to be aware of like, you know the 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 weather does play a factor. Uh, it it is a it is a role that we have to consider, and I think deer generally are are pretty hardy animals. I mean, they've, they've been around for eons, just living a good life outside. And, um, but to have them be in a place where they're, they're not getting sick or you're not having to treat them because of some bacteria or illness, it makes you look at that density in a, in kind of a new light and, and always prepare for the worst. Right. So you can say like Jared mentioned, like having enough deer to make money, um, it's, it's really a, it's a much deeper question, right? Because like you can say, oh, I need, 
whatever, 150 deer, and I can make a living on that. The question is, is well, what is the cost input of, of having those 150 deer? Because it's not just, it's not just like, oh, here's my feed cost. And, you know, here's a relative uh, med cost and everything will be fine. Right. Like, I, I don't, I don't think that's the calculation. I think it's a, a lot more uh, comprehensive in the way you have to look at it because you can throw events like weather, like a winter that uh, never comes. Right. And your, your pastures just take a beating. The animals are, I, I don't think they're, I don't think they're as healthy. Um, again, what is the measure of health? But yeah, Dan, what's up? You rolling? Hey. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've actually got a, a, a deer delivery coming right now, so I got to go do that. I'll try to jump back on after yeah, I'm cool. done with that. Hopefully, you guys are still here. Yeah, sounds so. good. Man. Take care. Okay, thanks. Um, and I, I think that, um, I think that calculation requires a lot of deep thought, and I, I, it's, it's hard to do, right? Because like you have, um, you have like a, a set amount of ground. Most of us do anyway. Where you know, like we have established farms and there's maybe not room for expansions or, um, I'm in that place. Um, I, I, I just, I, I look at it and I keep, I keep peeling my numbers back further and further and further, uh, or I try to anyway. And, uh, I, I, I wish that we would, I wish as an industry, we would have a, a more honest conversation about where we where we think those things are or have have more recommendations for folks to look at and and take an honest look at at their farm because i i i'm not sure it does us any favors um and you can see this as evidence in a lot of the facebook groups that we all participate in you know there's there's questions being asked like you know what do i do with this this is my 17th year that's got pneumonia or whatever that may be um do you guys have any further thoughts on on what that looks like uh, for you guys, maybe, or, or maybe on an, on an industry, uh, standpoint, like I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to force anybody to do anything, but I, I do think that we have a responsibility as an industry, um, to, to show our showcase, our animals in the, in the best light. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a tough, th there's, there's, I don't know if it's even 50, 50, you know, of people who have you know, in quotations, plenty of room and those that have mud pens, you know, um, I just was at a, I just was at a farm. Uh, I don't think they went and looked at enough places to, to see how much room they needed. I know they're very limited on space, but it was just dirt. There was just, you know, I mean, they had to have, and some part of the country, you know, let's go down South in Texas, they grow them on sand because nothing else grows. It's so dry and nasty. But, you know, I'm going to say that, you know, the Midwest and, and the, the, you know, the upper parts of, of the East, you know, where we actually have weather and ground that grows green stuff. Um, I think guys need to go and talk to someone who's, and of course, you know, I have experience, but I talk to, if people ask me a question, I'll answer it. I'll tell them, you know, six deer to an acre to fawn is probably plenty, you know, and you'll see guys having 20 deer in an acre fawn. And it just, it's, and then you wonder why, you know, this fawn's got a broken leg and that fawn died because couldn't find its mother and just, just all the troubles with overpopulation. You, you got to look at deer, you know, yes, we have them in pens, but you also got to look at them out in the wild where, mom kicks last year's fawns away and she goes finds her place to have babies we have them in a pen they still have to find us some place they feel comfortable to have their babies and if they're standing on top of each other then that, that you don't get that bonding right away and you run into then they don't get enough colostrum you know the first milk and then it just you know just piles on they get in you know, we, we talked about mud. You get into that May where it's raining and warmer, turns to mud again in the corners where they're standing, and then you got fawns just stuck stuck in mud. Um, I was in another fellow's house helping him tranquilize deer, and in the one corner was 18 inches deep of water, and the fawns would have to go through that, you know. Um, so there's, you know, there's things you have to do all the time to keep your pens up, you know, once they're established, but, but that 
that forward thinking, that going out there and you know getting the lay of your land, what you have available, and and start planning the design, you know, um, the first time uh, makes it a lot easier in the long run. Um, you, you know, I I've built one, two, three, four, four different work facilities and have fenced in three different properties myself and it helped with a bunch of others. And it's just tough. I can talk, I can talk till I'm blue in the face and I turn my back and I'm still doing stuff like, what in the heck are you doing? Why? One guy, oh yeah, I want 20 does. I want, I want 20 does. So I went there to help him build fence and he had enough room for eight does. But that's, you know, yeah, I want 20 does. So they've been a lot better off, um, you know, cutting back his numbers figuring out and then expanding from there rather than, you know, his business plan. He had a good business plan. He just didn't have the acres to do it. Yet. Yeah. I think that's important to match, to match, to match your land with what you can actually produce or what you're you know, matching a true business plan with, the, with the land that you have available and, and starting, I mean, I, I went through it. We, in my, the farm I have here at where the ranch is, um, you know, I'm up on a ridge. I think you've both been here. Josh, you've been here more than Fred, but it's, um, it's shaley and it, and it took a while to me to rebuild the topsoil to get, to get a, a deep rooted grass all over, all over the farm. And it's so easy to destroy that work in a, in a short period of time with too many animals. And I think if you start, you know, if you, if someone tells you six to seven deer per acre, well maybe start with three to four, and see where you can build to get or you know does per acre and the fawning mm -hmm. and see see where you know for me it was very easy to see where kind of the line was in density um and where the health issues really started to compound and and be a challenge to keep deer alive um i agree with everything fred said but um just start most guys need to start a lot a lot uh less deer than what they're what they're thinking when they get started I know it's probably a challenge sometimes because the business plan says, you know, this many deer, this amount of stocker bucks or whatever you're producing breeding stock. And, and then all of a sudden they do that and they don't have a third of the income they were hoping for um, yeah. because of losses, you know, it's um, to me, it's a huge deal. I mean, it, it's, it's um, down to the nitty gritty of mowing grass or not mowing grass. Josh and I have fun debates on this. You know, I, I try not to mow my grass less than six, eight inches and, I'm up on the Shaley Hill. So if it dries out, it dries out quick. And when I go into winter, I want 10, 12 inches of grass laying over and creating a good, a good layer of organic matter or, or ground cover that can take a little bit of beating where if you mow it down to the ground, come winter, it's in this time, like we were just talking about the, the warm weather and the wet conditions we've had. I mean, it can't take the beating in my opinion that something with 10, 12 inches of, of ground cut or, you know, grass that laid over can take. And, um, even with low densities, you know, so it's just, it's little things like that. Um, the corners, the, you know, if you have a buck in a pen breeding and you're going to use that pen to fawn out. Well, he's going to, we all, I mean, in my, in my farm, it's going to create the the muddy trails on the edges of the fences. Cause he's constantly walking up and down. I mean, I'm covering those with straw or wood chips right before fawning season. Um, and it's, it's a lot of work, but I, I, I don't want to see my fawn standing in any mud if I can help it, no matter what it is, in a corner or water, or take a shovel and dig that water hole out and cover it with wood chips or do do whatever you got to do to keep that ground dry, in my opinion, especially with your young fawns being born. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, Hang on, Fred. I, I got to make a comment about your black soil that's 14 feet deep. Um, I uh, I wish I had some Iowa dirt where I am because um, – I just, I am in not pretty ground, you know, like our, our natural pH up here. Uh, we, we were doing some soil testing at, at another farm I was working at and I yanked some samples out and they were like four, nine to five, one. And I was like, oh yeah, we can grow potatoes, you know, like it's just, it's not, it's not pretty, but you know, to Jared's point, um, you can, you can make it nice. It takes time. Uh, and, and certainly I know, I know Jared's place fairly well, and he's done a nice job at, at you know, working on that organic matter uh, much better than, than myself. Um, how does it, how does it feel to be in Southeast Iowa and in, in uh, ground that is already 
beautiful. Well, it's beautiful. Um, you know, I look out the window and it's just rolling hills with trees on the creek bottoms and crop ground all the way in between. <laughs> um, but yeah, our ground is fertile. You know, you, it, it, I haven't fertilized in years. Um, I'm, I just ordered fertilizer for the other, the other farm. And uh, it's been since 2000. So it's been 10 years since that's been fertilized heavily. But uh, I'm just, just thinking, you know, it's about time to maybe I get, we were so dry last year, you know, it didn't, it didn't produce the hay or the, the volume of grass that I thought we should. And so a little bit of fertilizer is not going to hurt it. You know, if we do get moisture and, and let it get a good, good kickstart. S something that just came to mind that I've never, I don't know if I've ever thought about it, but we talked about numbers of head per acre or per pen or, and, and it's almost, I just like, you know, maybe the more important way to look at that is number of pounds of deer per acre. Because as those fawns grow, all of a sudden, it's not the number of deer. It's we've got that many more pounds of animals on that on that ground. And, you, you know, all of us know that by the time them, them fawns are ready to wean, they're eating just as much as their mothers and putting on the same pressure on the ground. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the cattle farmers, they talk about cow-calf pairs. And I don't know if we ever, you know, if the deer people ever think of it that way, you know, a doe, a doe and her offspring uh, to a pen, you know. Um, and that's where the weight, you know, if you thought about how many pounds of deer can that chunk of ground sustain, you know, and how much, you know, Jared, with your, with your hunting ranch, you know, how much supplemental feed you have to put out, um, you know, or how many acres of beans can you plant so that deer can take advantage of some other plantings for their food. Um, a lot of people, well, no one thinks of that. You know, if your pens, Eugene Fleece, and I know I jump around, Eugene Fleece used to talk about not, not grass pens. He wanted them to be hay. He, he seeded for the pens to be hay ground. And so he had a mixture of grass, clover, and alfalfa, and that's what he would put in. And he would plow the fee the pens half each year and just keep you know and, and redo half of it and the next year redo it and then he would have good hay on the deer pens for the next three or four years and 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 you know that's what i first did and of course the deer just love to grub out the darn alfalfa and and clover where it's just grass you know a variety of grasses again so yeah, I, I like I, that. I never I, thought of that. The pounds, the pounds. Yeah. No, that's a, yeah, we're going to talk about that. It's because I know J Jared and I, we talk about a variety of health related things, but it's, it's almost always density dependent how the conversation goes. And um, uh, genetics obviously come into play, right? Um, because there's just no question that your Southern bred animals are smaller for a reason, right? Cause they got to deal with the heat and ours are, are generally larger because they got to deal with the cold. Um, and, and I, it's, it's hard to, when you start thinking about that pounds per acre, there's, there's a big difference between, you know, a big 180 pound doe and 110 pound doe and then her fawns and so on and so forth. Um, so maybe, maybe that calculation is a lot more important. Um, when you're kind of building out that original setup mm -hmm. or, or at least maybe how you manage. Um, yeah. I, maybe, maybe that's a worthwhile calculation. I know you, you mentioned beef and, and I've been, I've been, um, I've been digging into more grass fed beef or regenerative ag agriculture style uh, farming uh, more and more because I, I, I think that, um, it has, it can potentially have less input into it. Um, just from a work standpoint, like I watch some of these guys and they'll throw up their Instagram reel and you know, they're just moving an electric fence, right? They're like, here, check this out. And then they're strip grazing, heavy strip grazing, high density. And like, you're watching their pastures just boom, 
afterwards, right? Like they're just 30 days later, or maybe they're doing really intense crazy and they're letting the letting it off for a season, then coming back. And I cows are obviously much more chill than deer. Just it doesn't matter how calm your deer herd is, like they're just they're a lot more chill. Um so I often thought about like how whatever you want to call it, rotational grazing, right? But how do you move those does and fawns easily, right? Because you have different age classes of fawns. Like I can go pick up fawns anytime I want if they're under a week old, right? I can move moms and like that's fine. But like, how do you move them when they're you got four week old fawns and you got because they're stupid, right? Let's just be clear. Like a four week old fawn is about as dumb an animal on the farm as you can get. And when yeah. I say dumb, I'm talking about their excitability to outside influences. And then you have you know, that span back to newborns. So like, have you guys thought about those kinds of things like with rotation and, you know, uh, different pens or alleyways or pastures or things like that? Yeah, never, never. I've never thought of it during the year during, you know, during the fawning season from year to year. Yes. But not during the year. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a percentage of folks that have the room or have made the room where they can rest a pen and, and move the deer to fawn in a completely clean pen that's had that's rested for a year. And, uh, there's certain, there's certainly advantages to that. Um, I guess the other thing, you know, if, you know, and, and we all have the same idea of density. I think, uh, I get by a little bit higher cause, because I got maybe better dirt. I don't know. But do that, do that herd health thing, you know, go out there and, you know, vaccinate your herd for what's up, what, you know, what the cattle guys do in your area. Um, take, take uh, parasite samples, you know, take, take fecal samples in and, and run your parasites. So, you know, oh God, I'm just packed in this one pen. I really need to do something. You know, the last time I did the whole farm, I had one doe that had like four eggs. It was like nothing. Everything else was clean. And so, so I don't worm as much as I used to, you know, deworm as much as I used to. I don't use decocks like I used to. I clean the farm up and, 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 and it's basically clean as long as I don't bring in a whole herd of deer, you know, from someone else. And, but, but you have to, that's all part of learning, you know, you I sit here in the window and I can see all my pens. And if I have, don't do those tests, I don't know what's going on out there. You know, that those fecal tests, because that's another, that's a big stressor and, and that can go through everything. You know, that's one that your fawns at 40 days old or at 21 days old, they're already shedding eggs and they're already reproducing in them. And you want to talk about stress, something to pull down and kill your fawns a heavy load of parasites or coccidia, which I call, just call another parasite. But, uh, you know, it goes back to that density again, much easier to control if they're not standing on top of each other, you know, getting shit on all the time. So excuse my, excuse my French. I, we, 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 we didn't get it. We, that, that word wasn't prohibited. It was the other one. <laughs> oh, okay. so thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Josh, I think when you talk about like that, you're talking about, uh, kind of intensive grazing and and whatnot on the cattle side of things um obviously we have different a different species of animal um i, I guess the context of what or what, what are you trying to do with that that consistent movement i mean if like fred mentioned about uh the hay pastures and mixing clover and alfalfa i mean I, i've had times where i'll take a pen <clears throat> i don't have enough room to have a bunch of pens empty for you know a, even a season or two seasons or but i have had you know i can take one pen reseed it or i'll take for me it's it's crimson clover or, or red clover is what works on my hills um once i can get that established even if once i put four or five does per acre in there it's not going to take them two three weeks to to knock that clover out and not touch the orchard grass not not touch it you know what i mean they're gonna they're gonna pick through so um if you were I don't know. I don't know if I see the value in, in consistently moving deer like they like they do in the cattle side of things. I just we're, we don't have grazers while they do certainly eat some of that grass. They're, they're not 
they're not going through and mowing it down like a, like a cow's going to. And I don't know if they're necessarily having the animal impact that, you know, 1100 or 1900 pound cow is going to have on the ground. So um, I definitely see the benefit of, of lower densities or if you don't, if, or if you want to push your densities and, and have an open pens for the freshness of it, um, I, I think there's benefit there, but I, I do, I do, I don't know if I see the benefits of, of moving them like that in a deer herd. Now, I'm not saying there's not, I'm just, I'm just curious. I don't, I don't know if I see that. Um, and one thing, this is, this is jumped around like, like Fred said, but I don't know the answer to this, but I do wonder if you know, we're talking about fertility of soil or, you know, like, like Fred has his deeper soils where I'm up on the Shaley hillsides. Um, I imagine there's a magic number there, but where's the, you know, can Fred hold six, seven does per acre where my, my sweet spot is, is I'm talking does with fawns, but is, is around four, four or five does per acre is that it's all context. You know, I, I, I think six or seven is high for me to, to have the health that I've been having with, you know, three and a half to five, depending on which pens they're in and, and what time of the year, but um, certainly there's fertility in those soils, but how does that impact, you know, if we have the same one acre ground and Fred has 10 inches of nutrient rich soil and I got three inches of, you know, shale based, a little bit of topsoil. Where's what, if there is a thing, what is causing Fred to be able to have six or seven, six does breaker and Jared to have four? Like what, it, it, I, I don't know that answer, but like, is there something there with fertility or is one acre, one acre in a sense of a deer's impact and health of, of those deer? I, I don't know that answer, but I'm, I'm curious on your guys' thoughts on that. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Draining, you know, dra I've been to Louisiana, Louisiana, Louisiana. I don't know how you say it. And, you know, that's pretty flat down there, pretty marshy. Everything's flat. And, man, I would hate living there because, you know, it's wet. It's, you know, if it rains, it's wet. There's... Um, low spots almost everywhere. And I don't, you, like you say, we go from, we have, you know, deer in every part of this country. Um, you, what is the right number? And I think you have to figure that out your, yourself or kind of try to anecdotally figure out, okay, what, what can I do? You know, Louisiana, it's green year round, never, never freezes, but they also have a terrible parasite load. You know, the, the bugs that don't get to die in the winter time. You know, we get a break from bugs for, you know, five months, six months where, where, where we all live in, 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 uh, in, the, in the hemisphere, you know. Um, and I go out, then I, and I, you know, we're talking whitetails, but I go out west. I know a fellow out there with mule deer and he'll take, I think his pens are an acre and a half and fawn out five mule deer does in that acre and a half and it's plenty you know it's plenty because i mean and, and it's all grown up into native grass but you, you don't want many more than that because they just beat each other up so bad you know so um and i still have pens here that are in my mind single doe pens i'll i got does that i know are just mean and they go in them single pens so so that i don't have that stress out in a pen as well um but there's a lot of things have to be learned. And that's where those fellas starting out. Let's go back to Facebook. You see a Facebook. I need to buy some does and a buck. I'm going to start raising deer. Well, Facebook's the wrong place to start asking questions. Because, you know, if, if, if Josh is right and we have a hundred years of experience on here, um, no one's asking me the right questions to, to help them through the process. You know, they're, taking advice from someone who started raising deer two and three years ago and is just now selling their first animals and, and haven't learned any hard knocks, you know, it's a school of hard knocks. And it's just, it's, it's, they're selling themselves short. They really need to spend some time. You, you know, cattle guys, I, I always like to go back to cattle guys because I out here in dairy country you know, where I grew up and now it's beef country. The cattle guys, the ones that take over, have raised deer their whole lives or have raised beef their whole lives, okay? So dad has taught them everything they need to know. We're taking guys out of the city or have been in the country, haven't raised deer, and now they want to raise these animals from scratch. And there's just so much to learn, 
So and, yeah, and, I, w- I would and, say we're ta- we're taking hunters who like deer that want to raise deer, yeah, and, and trying to make them farmers. That's yeah, it. and th- and to me, that's two different. It's two different creatures. You know, I farm deer. Okay, I'm not the killer. I'm the guy that keeps them alive and gets them to the hunting range, and and it's really two different two different mentalities. You know, um, and 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 Jared, you know it'd be tough for me to do what you do, you know, that full spectrum of I'm working all year to keep them alive. And then all of a sudden I got changed my change gears. And now I've got to keep all of these alive. Plus I'm going out and harvesting with folks. And it just, the duality, it, it just seems difficult for me to, to do because while your hunting season's going on, I'm thinking about reproduction. You know, that's, that's what I'm working on. I'm delivering deer in the fall. Uh, you know, and you are still trying to raise your deer in the pens, you keep your fawns going, and then you're gone from the breeding herd for months, you know, three, four months, um, working with the, the hunting ranch and the hunting, you know, cabin. That, and things. That, that's a good point, and, and not to keep beating on it, but like, I, I think what I've, what I've come and how we've, I've come to manage my breeding herd is that low density, low maintenance type of herd is at least my goal. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not saying this is right, and I'm still scared every year. But I'm I'm on my fourth, going on my fourth fawning season that I haven't vaccinated and haven't dewormed. Um, I contribute some of that to the way I've been managing the pens. However, to the testing point of of taking fecal samples and and keeping on top of that is um is important. You know, I'm I'm trying to create a durable animal where it doesn't need a whole lot of of maintenance. Um, that's my mm-hmm. goal. But with that comes lower densities and maybe, you know, if I were to push a little more numbers, then I would have to be more intense with my vaccination, more intense with my my fecal sampling. Um, I, I, want, I need a productive herd. And I think I've been more productive per unit of animal in the last six, seven years. Um, but to your point, Fred, it it, um, it is important to me to have a, a, a highly durable herd that doesn't take a lot of maintenance and yeah. um and some of that comes with calling weak animals and weak might just be you know bad mothers or maybe they can't handle the way i'm managing them and i, and I just see that by visually looking at the them not being productive so could they be fixed yes am i going to take the time to fix them no that's kind of my mentality now with how yeah. i look at my animals and it takes time and i'm not sure if i'm gonna you know i'm always worried there's going to be a disaster on the horizon but so far it's been working and it's 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 um I guess it's how intense you want to be with how you're managing your animals. And, and you got to bounce that to your yeah. point for it with what else you have going on in your life. And maybe it's not a hunting ranch. Maybe it's you're a business owner of a whole different business and you want a yeah. enjoyable, profitable hobby. So maybe high number or whatever, finding that sweet spot of a, a low maintenance herd might be the path for you to take as someone who wants to come home after work or work the weekend warrior when you're vaccinating that type of stuff and still have a healthy, productive herd, you're just, your numbers are a little different than another farm's numbers, right or wrong, you know, it's just yeah. different. Yeah. I have, there's, ooh, ooh, you know, that time, I have a lot of does have triplets, you know, well, ends up, there's all, just always one little tiny, tiny thing. And, and I mean, way too small. And I had a buddy once says, you're not, and I spend some time, don't get me wrong. I don't just knock it in the head. I give it extra claustrum, you know, and try to get it going. But there's a point in time, like you're talking durable herd, that animal wouldn't make it in the wild. Why am I working so hard here? But I give them a chance. And then a buddy of mine says, well, what if it's the next Artie? I said, I don't want the next Artie to start out like this. Not at, you know, two pounds or three pounds, you know, it's just, the durability you know the the you know you're 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 putting the weight of your herd on a on a fawn that could have been way too poor and you know starting out and that's not what i want you know i want animals that and josh has seen them you've seen them josh talks about them yeah he stood up out there as a fawn and he had his chest out and he looked like a breeder buck already you know as a little tiny baby and that's that's your durability. That's the ones that can stand that extra pressure and just move forward. And, and, you know, that's what my buck fawns look like this year. I'm as proud as I've ever been of my buck fawns. They just, just big chested, tall, you know, want to, you know, just healthy, just 
Really yeah, yeah. I, I feel the same. And, and I, however, I mean, I have a whole lot of respect and, and it's mostly women to give them the credit, the girls in our industry that, that bottle raise and can take those fawns that I can't save. Cause I, yeah, no, I'll just say I, I can't, and maybe not willing to put the time in to save those little fawns. I, I've, we've heard the stories and seen the people that can do that and make them a healthy animal and, and great all the credit to you. It's just not the animals I want reproducing yeah. in my herd. You know, it's yeah. just not where I want to be. So we've, <clears throat> we moved into a, an interesting area of conversation. So I'm going to add another component to it and that's going to be um, assessment of animals and genetics. So we're talking about, We've talked about health. We move from pen density into the health arena, all in the management space. Uh, curious, and I think this is, I think this is worth noting, right? Because when I look at, and and we can all base this on our own experiences. When I look at my herd, I've said before that the deer I have at my place, like if each of us went to each other's farm and managed them for one year, we would be less successful than that person who owns that herd in, in that management. And so I look at, I look at that and I say, every deer has a story and that story is their, their history and your history with those animals. And like, at this point in like my career doing this, we've all had multiple decades of, of, management of these animals um I, i've i've selected certain does I'm, I'm just talking about does at this point i've sele selected certain does because of attributes that i personally like um durability being one of them and of course i break rules just like everybody else i i make decisions based on emotion because i'm a human being right like oh i like this deer and you got to keep her around and blah, blah, blah. You know, you make excuses for your, your own poor management decisions. Mm -hmm. um, those are the outliers, at least for me. Right. And I try not to make too many of those because then my, my herd quality goes down. So when you guys, when you guys look at the, the current group of does you have today, what are some of the things that you're looking for and how does that fit into the management strategy that, We've just kind of discussed, obviously the target continues to move because we want to get better at what we do, but what are some of those attributes that you guys think have, have merit, um, on the doe side? And I, I'm not talking about antlers. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about raising big bucks because that's a separate issue. I'm talking about health. I'm talking about reproduction quality, all those things. Yeah, it's a deep question. <laughs> well, here, I'll start. I think bo the, both of you are more into the uh, data than I personally am with my herd these days. Um, could be wrong. I'm just going off of what I've heard you two, how you two talk. Um, a lot of a lot of what I'm looking so, – so in the past couple of years, two years specifically, um, I was listening to a farmer of cattle, um, but uh, – you know, first time mothers, um, I, again, I could be, I could be making a mistake here, but if the, when I say first time mothers, I'm talking about two year old does dropping their first set of fawns. I'm not talking about a fawn having at one year old dropping fawns. I'm talking about two year old does. Um, I've been pretty hard on those does as far as if they can't raise me a healthy fawn that first year and my numbers are where you know, I have enough numbers of does that are that lower spectrum of does is, is getting removed from my breeding program. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure I might miss some, but if, if they're dropping me a stillborn or they're not, if they're not getting that, raising that fawn, um, they immediately go on the low, low totem pole, regardless of pedigree, regardless of history of the mother. I'm just, I think I'm starting with those young does that, going back to hit, jumping around. I mean, the history of the mom, mom plays a part too, but as I, usually it's that mom, their mother or grandmother was also a decent mom that first time around. So one thing I'm looking at in my female herd is, is right off the bat, are they able to raise their fawns their first year? And if not, um, unless I'm low on doe numbers, which I don't have really a breeding outlet. So that's not really a problem for me. 
So I am, uh, I'm removing those those from my, from my core breeding program. Um, one or two, I break my own rules. Like you said, Josh, there, there's a specific girl I kept on a farm this year that uh, I gave one more chance um, just because the history of the female maternal line has been so good that I'm hoping it was a mistake, but um, on her end, but uh, that's one thing I'm looking at in my doe herd. Can, can they raise a healthy, big, healthy fawn? Forget big. Can they raise healthy fawns? Um, and uh, that that's just going off the, off the maternal side. Now, we were talking about durability. I'm jumping back. Sorry, I get off subject. But durability, you know, there's one thing to have look at your animals and know your animals and then have your own breeder buck that you use that comes from those, quote, unquote, whatever you decided those are those durable animals. But I break I break my rule every single year with AI because I'm not visiting a farm checking on, you know, whoever's buck I bought to know his history or his maternal history and how durable those deer are. So, again, I'm, I'm kind of taking a chance with AI, putting into my quote unquote durable females and then, you know, waiting a couple of years down the road to see how, how that works out. Because I'm, I'm basically going, well, for me now, it's either CWD genetics and antler characteristics is kind of. The, the AI part of the program. So I might break that rule of quote unquote durability because I just don't know how durable these bucks I'm using for AI truly are. Um, so I just got to learn from their offspring that we have on our farm to, to go from there. But um, from a maternal standpoint, I'm, I'm starting to judge my females early and, and pretty harshly. I, 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 it's harsh compared to what I, how I used to judge them. I, mean, I used to give those does another chance and be like, Hey, you know, I can, I can, I hate to say this, but, when I had the breeding outlets, I got to keep everything alive because you can sell some of those pedigrees, which now, and that's a terrible, to me, that's a terrible, terrible way to look at it now. But, um, cause I, why wouldn't I want to buy the most durable animals? You know, that's a whole nother subject, but, um, I am judging my females pretty harshly, uh, these days, as far as when they first start fawning. So that's one thing I look at. So I look at, uh, my, 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 upbringing is dairy cows and and I showed cattle and I showed hogs and I've showed rabbits and I've showed chickens and show animals and so when I pick out does and I yes I do pedigrees but they also have to meet these other physical requirements you know they got to be put together right you know not short and dumpy you know, not thin and bony. They, 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 you know, they've got to be able to be easy keepers, you know, that it doesn't take, you know, your word is durability, um, easy keepers, you know, do what they're supposed to do without all kinds of, in, you know, human interactions. Um, uh, in, in what I find, I'm just terrible at calling at the upper ages. So one of those really good, she's here till she dies, you know, she's here till she's 14, 15 years old when it's a good one. And, and I guess that's my way of maybe thanking her for what she did when she was younger, you know? Um, but when they get start getting 14, 15 years old, they can skip breeding for a year and, and then they can run into other problems, you know, but, um, but no, I look at confirmation, um, a lot on the breeding side of stuff. I, I tell you what, guys, I have, my herd is, is almost 50, 50 now, or two thirds, one third animals that I register and I, and I do all the AI and stuff with, and then there's two pens of does, you know, that are just production of bucks, you know, that their, their background is great. You know, that I've been breeding them in as a group, as opposed to individual breeding, so I'm stacking the same bucks on that whole group of does and, and, and I don't, I'm not worrying about the pedigree on them because I'm, I'm looking at them like, okay, these are the true production. These are the ones that, you know, I want them to look all exactly the same. I don't want that, that outcross, that variety from outcross and stuff. And, and, um, and I, and I guess that's an easy, you know, those are easy ones because, I, all those I started out with, they're all from the same buck. They're all great, big, long, tall does. Uh, they have Artie in the background or Augie in the background, you know, and it just, we're just bringing forward that stuff. But I haven't worried about the freaking pedigrees, you know, it's just not, 
it's their true production where and you guys both know that I sure don't I sure don't chase the gen the, the, the popular genetics you know I've done what I want to do and have somehow made it you know um, but then then I intense intensely breed the other two-thirds of the herd you know and some of that is maybe I've gotten too old to keep track of all of them but it's just it's just like no, these are production. You know, these, if I need some does out of that same group to replace the older ones, they just, they get saved for a year. You know, they get to grow up and have fawns. And, um, and I have been breeding fawn. I have been breeding fawns, AI and fawns of that group. Um, Cause my idea is, okay, if they'll have me, you know, 10 out of 10, if five of them will have AI babies and then breed back and have another, you know, so seven or eight out of 10 doe fawns, they're faster in production. You know, I get to choose, Jared, I get to choose them at one if they're productive, you know, as yeah. opposed to you keeping them for two years. Yeah. And, and it all comes down to, you know, it all comes down to economics, the payoff to how much do I spend for reproductive science to the production I get, you know, is it, is it worth that on this, on that third, that third of the herd group of does, or do I just go off to the woods and pull out a nice looking two-year-old buck and put in the pen and let them breed? So, um, so I bred that, I did AI that group all to, all to one buck this year. That whole group got bred to one buck and I pulled a nice two-year-old out and they all got backed up to one buck. So it, it's, it's, I make that, that group of does is easy. It's, it's where the, the other two thirds, I just wear myself out trying to make sure, you know, that Roman was the right buck to breed with, or America was the right buck to breed with, you know, just, it's just like, you know, I've, you know, the width, the tying length, the body size, the, you know, all, all the things in the other two thirds of the herd. So yeah. It, 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 in all honesty, I feel like, my whole herd is your one third and I'm relying on you guys to make the decisions on that intensive side. Like the true, I'm going to call, I'm going to call it the, I don't know if it's the right term, but the, the true breeders worrying about the, not worrying, considering individual characteristics and then me being able to go out as, you know, I, I 100%, I still AI, but I consider myself a stalker producer and I'm, and I'm making my own replacements, but I'm relying on you guys that are intensely breeding in that direction to, to, to find the characteristics that I want to bring into my herd as a stocker producer. You know, I, yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 that's how I look at pretty much the majority of my herd. I love, I, I mean, I know my pedigrees in my head, but I'm not doing all the work to, I, I'm banking samples on most of them, but uh, um, I'm not doing the work like I was because the breeding outlet is, is number one, it's not there for me. And my main focus is producing the best stalkers I can produce for our ranch and the best does for my ranch as well to then in turn, you know, create those stalkers. So um, good stuff. Yeah. I want to just welcome Dan back on. Dan, I hope your uh, hey, stocking and delivering went well. Welcome back. Um, we um, just to just to recap, we we no, were talking about. I don't want to interrupt you, but yeah. are you sure that's not Elvis back in the room? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there he is. Yep. Um, we we were talking about like pen density and and having some discussions on um, pasture, and we came up with um, some work for all of us to do, and that's instead of deer per acre, it's pounds per per acre uh, calculation on on animals, and then uh, we shifted into uh, some of the the things that we look for in our own doe herds uh, that that are important to us as people that that raise deer. Um, what are some of the qualities of of the does that we like to keep around, and maybe some of the qualities that we like to remove? Um, so that's that's where we're at today, and we we basically we came up with um, two things, and I'm going to have a follow up question for Fred on um, one of those. Uh, one is is um, you know can a can a doe a first time mom raise a healthy fawn or healthy fawns, um, and then the second one would be having easy keepers or um, some level of of 
confirmation, if you will. Now, Fred, you mentioned the word confirmation. What is what does that look like for you specifically um, when you say that? Because I, 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 I'm not sure that everybody understands exactly what you're looking at. So give us a rundown of of what confirmation is in your dose. Um, I sh you know, I, I've had, I have all this stuff written down. I've done all these, you know, I drive miles and miles and miles or I used to, and I'd write notes down and, but, but, um, you know, long back that neck, that neck connection from the back to, from the back to the neck, you know, the, the head, I learned long ago that if your doe has a nice domed head, the antlers on the bucks are going to come out the side more. Um, um, my does must produce milk. I've got does that you guys would think were freaking dairy cows, you know, in the spring because they have such huge udders to produce milk. I, in my mind, growing up as a dairy farm, we're taking feed and we're producing and we're turning it into a calcium product, either, you know, milk and a dairy product. Well, in deer, we're making milk and antlers, both calcium products. So if I had really large udders, I anecdotally uh, felt that that would make really large antlers. And it, and it does. It does. So uh, Angela was, you know, had the largest domed head and had the largest udder. And, and I just kept that going. Uh, I've got udders that could feed six or eight fawns. It's just stupid. I had one years ago and it was a full sister to Amos. It was so big that it busted open guys. It wasn't infected. It just had so much pressure. It wasn't feeding enough fawns. It actually split open and stitching up an udder and getting it to go back together is a, is a mess. It is a mess, but I caught her. I got her back to normal, but, Jared, she's not one that didn't take a lot of maintenance. I mean, she she was, she was a pain. So, yeah. and her daughters aren't quite so bad. And I have two of her daughters, and and they produce tons of milk. You know, they could feed easily feed four fawns. You know, like most normal does do. Um, so good feet and legs. You know, feet that you don't have to that you never think. Oh, maybe I should trim that. They're they're always they're always up on their toes the way they should be. You know, they're not flat in the pasterns. You know, the word sickle hocks where their ankles come to or their knees come together in the back. You want to, you know, it's like any animal. You want to make sure that's square so that their bat their weight is balanced on all four corners. Um, and then I I truly I so Dean Dean Bontrager used to his deer were giant and they were my mind dairy animals okay they were they were they didn't carry a lot of weight to, to grow big antlers well i want to i want a doe that's a little bit more towards the beef side of stuff carries a little bit more cover you know has that has that ability to carry more weight um and it just and it, and that goes back to you know jared the hunting side of things i'm in the north i'm in the midwest i want a big bodied buck when it leaves the farm you know and so that's that's something that i keep in mind as well on the females is is and josh gets to weigh his he has a scale i just have to you know look at him and know what i know when a doe's 200 pounds because i can't lift her you know i mean it's just a sob so so i look at that you know the doe's got to have that show quality to her to be in my that top two thirds of my herd, you know, like I said, the, that other third, and they all look, the, they, they get looking really consistent. Cause that's, like I said, get bred to one buck, another buck, another buck. And with, you know, with the long tines and long beams, the inside spread in generation after generation. And, and then their fawns all of a sudden just look the same where the other herd, you know, I'm breeding, let's say five does to one buck is an outcross and two does to a buck for an outcross. Well, underneath is all the same, but with those different outcrosses has changed. I've lost that consistency, you know, of, of body size, of, of style, let's say more style. Um, but if, you know, if I, 
but I'm not redoing what I'm doing. I'm too old to change everything, but a guy could make a pretty cool herd if he didn't give a crap about selling, selling breeding stock and just wanted to produce big boned, big antlered, not big antlered, good looking antlered bucks. I think you could do that in a short order, short order of time. And then, and then go into the whole herd with AI and put a buck, put a, a new buck on the whole group of does to give you that fresh, that freshness, you know. Um, if you guys don't know, I like lion breeding. Um, it's not as tight as what, as what people really think. If they just look at them, you know, yeah, I call them all the A-team. You go back to Roy Yoder, his were all redoy, whatever, you know, it's marketing and, and, yeah, I got deer that's going to be 14, 13, 15 times Angela in them, you know, but still there's an outcross in there every time. So breeding is, you know, is my thing. I really enjoy it. And, um, but I've really decided this strategies that I want to use, you know, and, and like I said, Jared, I, I like having part of the herd that's just, they're out there doing their thing. You don't have to worry about them as much, you know, just, yeah. It's, it's nice. So, and I have a question for Fred. Yeah, bud. So, you know, say that you've got a, a new breeder that comes along or, or somebody new that wants to get into the, into the, the breeding world. I mean, what type of advice do you give them when they buy an animal from you? Well, from um, me. Moving forward. I can give you, I can give people good advice on what to do with my deer. Again, again, um, with the A team, I have 20 plus years of uh, breeding them and knowing what, what they can and cannot do. With my deer, I can do that. You know, again, on that Facebook thing, guys, they throw a doe pedigree out there. We've all seen it. And they said, what should we breed this doe to? And it's a easy. It's easy for me to tell them, Artie, you know, breed the damn things to Artie. Right over my head, that's Artie. You know, because because the thing needs needs some northern blood in it. Get it some body size. Give it some stamina. Give it, you know, give it whatever. And I know what Artie can do. So, so Dan, to answer your question, if someone buys a deer from me, I can tell them what they should do with it. You know, I I sold some does to a fellow up northwest Iowa. And he got I, I, I put embryos in the one doe and she gave him two. Um, two fawns out of the embryo and then the other doe uh, I thought was bred but wasn't bred to the buck that I wanted her to be, breed to I gave him a straw semen to what I wanted her to breed to in the first place you know because that's just what I do I know that's what she should have been bred to so I gave him a straw um, another thought I just had I used to use this 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 world-renowned veterinarian to do all my AI work and um, collect semen and AI my does and and all of a sudden one year he realized that that I had this one doe and I don't know why he finally figured it out but was only getting bred to one buck every year he said why why are you doing that why aren't you breeding her to something else I says I look at her and she only needs to be bred to high roller for the rest of her life and that's just that's just what it was. If you didn't get it, you know, you know how many genes are involved, you know, eventually, hopefully she was going to live long enough to do what I knew she could do. But there was no other buck in the country that she needed to be bred to except for high roller. And he, he couldn't see that. He was all about st st stacking name brand bucks, you know, and I was all about knowing what deer needed to breed what deer to produce the traits that I wanted. And, and it's two different ways of looking at things, you know, and we see a lot of that, you know, in the so-called breeder market, it's just brand name, buck, brand name, buck, brand name, buck, brand name, buck. And then you go back five or six generations and clear down the bottom is some phenomenal doe, you know, that was up and up North here. And they just diluted all that with, with, the flavor of the month, the flavor of the day. And, and it's just, well, you know, guys, I, I haven't done that. And my deer still bring 
decent money when I get into these auctions, you know, and they bring better money at home. Um, but I've stood on that limb hard. And so again, Dan, if you buy a doe from me, I can tell you what to breed her to. I can tell you what to breed her to. Um, so yeah, I just else. figured over the years, you know, you've, you've, you've sold, you know, many of animals and you've seen what they've, you know, been bred to over the years. And I just didn't know if you'd seen, you know, some, some things that, I mean, obviously some things that you like, some things that you don't like, but has it ever influenced you to change some of your program that you've ever done seeing what they've done with your animals? It's, it's been kind of cool uh, here in the, here in the state there are over time there are a lot of a lot of fellows who raise 18 deer i mean a lot of them and in the hunting ranches just love our deer you know love what we produce and you know i had a set of brothers last year um that were both <laughs> the brothers both six by sixes um both right there at that 230 mark uh one was two inches wider than the other and single brows a couple extras and they were the easiest thing for a ranch to hunt you know and it was just and then i had 20 26 of them there was one great big one uh the ranch i sold to they said i had the top four typical bucks on the farm that's that's what i want to do i want to raise those animals that 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 the hunter wants to shoot, wants to be the very first ones. There was years ago, I went after the first week and there were five arty sons on the, on the porch. The first five hunters all took arty sons. And it just, it's just like reassuring that what I've been doing for all these years was the right, you know, is, are, was, were the right thing, you know? And um, so so yeah, I, and, and, and the years, you know, um, there was a million years ago with you guys, I, I bought deer out of Arkansas that were out of a 236 inch buck and then they were small, they were small deer. But again, he was probably a wild caught buck, you know, and just collected semen. And I bred, I line bred that buck and produced, and produced a 130 inch two year old buck, just a piece of crap. Well, knowing what I know, I had to breed him because all the genetics were in there. He just wasn't expressing them right. And all his babies were three times bigger than he was. You know, it was just, you just bite the bullet. You know what you've done and you know what's there and you just have to do it. And that's what, that's what people who are getting into this breeder, breeder market they don't have a clue what they're going to produce. They don't have a clue what the deer are going to look like. And that's what I want. I want to know 80% chance of what that deer is going to look like. You know, uh, a breed for single brows, a breed for split two, split threes, you know, flyers. You know, I, that's what I want to be able to sell folks. And Dan, that's, you asked me if you, you buy a deal from me, I can tell you what to breed it to. I can tell you what bucket needs to be outcrossed to if we're going to, if we're going to do that, you know, um, my time length is stopped at about uh, 17 inches. So the bucks that I've outcrossed to have 19 and 20 inch times, you know, I'm, I got the width, I got the mass. I would like to add two more inches of times. And I, I don't know how many people look at their deer that way, you know, that what can I put in there to add this little trait to them? and have a consistent deer. Because I'm gonna say it again, if you got five generations of different Texas deer in your pedigree, you, you don't know what you're gonna, you, you know, it's gonna be big probably, but you don't know, I mean, is, is it gonna have time lengths over 12 inches? No, it's gonna have 10 inch tines. The twos are gonna be shorter than the threes. You know, they're gonna be wide and they're gonna have 27 inch beams. And it, it, it's just not, it's not what I wanna produce. You know, it's not what I want to do. So. So we. Um, I'm running the gap of charger. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Um, so we. Um, we touched on some of the standards for the, the does. Uh, I'd like to bring the bucks into the equation. So. When we look at these, when we look at our 
our herds of of does when you're when you're selecting for for bucks what are some of the attributes that you guys are looking for to make quality crosses um in in those that next generation of of animal dan you can you can run uh i could use a little bit of width in, in our in our herd you know so i've been you know leaning towards bucks that are a little bit wider but i also have this addiction to time length you know i love i love long times and uh so i you know i, I always find myself looking at looking at deer that have really long times you know i mean roman i thought was just a really cool long time deer you know wasn't necessarily super wide uh you know like the 30 inch mark or whatever but you know i i incorporated him you know just just based on those long times that i like and i think it match as well with some of the the holly line that i have from years back you know the long time queen they called her and uh but you know we are trying to incorporate some of the width and and nowadays um you know the the genetic uh, cwd resistance breeding with the gebv and and the uh wheel markers so that would be kind of what i've been and and big bodies you know those those big bodies were in the north here in new york and, you know, our hunters just desire those, those giant bodies, you know, that's, that's a big, a big thing. We've, we've stayed uh, with the hundred percent Northern genetics all these years. Um, even though they weren't the marketable thing at the time, we've just kind of stuck with it. I've stuck with it. And uh, so, you know, Northern long times uh, with um, breeding values and, uh, and large bodies for us. Hmm. Fred. Beam length, time length, inside spread. And always the, I, it's always the same, huh? It, oh, it's, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Um, if you don't have the beam length, you can't put a six by six, seven by seven mainframe on it. If you don't have the beam length, you can't have Roman with 30 whatever beams and that great times and just have this wonderful look to him. Um, I, I kind of class Roman, your Roman and uh, OMG in kind of the same class. They have some great traits, but they're, they look a little narrow, you know, so there's a place for them. There's a place for them. I think in any one of our herds, those, those bucks. Um, but yeah, beam length, uh, I've got them up to 34 inches. Uh, I took Argus daughters this year and bred them to, um, sundowner who had 36 inch beams um it's a crazy idea but let's see if we can get something longer than 36 inch beams um i've already talked about time length but uh, and then inside spread you don't need that deer that goes straight out you need that deer that looks looks wide and then it still comes around and makes a complete beam you know um uh, Fleece used to raise a lot. Of, well, let's take, let's not pick on fleece. Uh, Wall Vogels, Max, only had 26 and 27 inch beams, you know, and it's like, what do you do with all that? You can't, you can't put anything else on it. It just stops. So um, I've been very lucky. I got, I got a room full of antlers here that 30 inch beam is the short side of stuff, you know, um, 33, 32, 34. Um, all over the place, you know, so beam length, time length, inside spread. And then I talked about the show animal, you know, the, the quality of the body, the, the stature, the body size. Um, yeah. Northern deer, Northern deer. Jared. Um, a lot of what both gentlemen just said, and then his, uh, lines that have historically crossed well for me. Um, Max Bo Sundance, obviously I'm talking maybe generations down, but Max Bo Sundance, PA Geronimo Fleece, um, a mixture of those genetics. Uh, Fleece Max Bo has done well for me. It's done well for lots of people, but, um, you know, lines that have historically crossed well, kind of just somewhat repeating the same thing. And then um, finding guys who are, are breeding the traits like Fred is talking about intensely and trying to utilize their bucks because they're they're finding breeders who are truly putting the work into beam beam length spread what am i missing there uh and time length like fred was talking about finding the guys who have truly put the time in to those traits in their animals and frankly utilizing their animals into my herd um 
to create the best stalkers and, and the best shootability of my bucks that I can on a consistent basis. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, yeah, I'll just stop there. Yeah. That's pretty much what I'm looking at. All right. We're going to, we're going to segue into the first delineation of the lightning round. So these are one word answers, guys, one word answers. All yes. Right? Okay. Yes. What is the most overrated antler trait that you could breed for? Excellent. Oh, these are, this is, these this yes is good no TV. <laughs> they are yes or no. It's just one word. Try the try it. Overrated. That's okay. Got it. I got it. Go ahead. Non-typical. Okay. It's one word. There's a dash, but okay, we'll we'll go with it. Marketability. Okay. Is that a trait? That's not a trait, Dan. <laughs> oh, God. I like it. A... Go ahead, Jared, while Dan ponders the... Oh, man. Um... What was the question again? <laughs> what is the most uh, overrated trait someone yeah. can breed for? Eight by eight. Hmm. These aren't correct answers. These are one word answers. That's correct. Yep. Stumped. Stumped. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say mass. The most heritable of all traits, but mass. Yeah. Our, our pen deer only need a, a little above normal. <laughs> I mean, they really do. They don't, yeah. you know, talk anything about, over 40 is plenty on yeah. almost every deer. You don't need 64. Not, okay. So, no, you don't need 64. You know, <laughs> um, okay. You... Best. Yeah. Go ahead, Jared. No, I didn't know if we were continuing discussion. I mean, sure. Yeah. No, no. Go yeah, to the next no. question. Next yeah. Question. Okay. So, so there, this is a two part question. The first question is, what is the greatest breeder buck of all time that's not yours? And then what's the greater, greatest breeder buck of all time that maybe is yours? It could be your favorite. It could be the best. It could. This is obviously just opinion. I'll, I'll start. I think. I think one of the best breeder bucks of all time uh that's not on my farm is high roller that's that's kind of where i was headed well that one's taken so they have to be different answers so this is now Mine's a process max bow there you go see the other guys are just excluding from their their list jared so well done on going second <laughs> little boomer little boomer it's okay fred you're gonna have to just Say a name. You got the biggest challenge, Fred. It's, you've been there longest. Well, no, there's no wells. It's just a name. Okay. One word. One word. <laughs> the original Johnny Buck. Okay. I like that. All right. Greatest reader buck that can be yours. Um, or you've had on your farm. Same answer. Actually, I kind of want to change my first answer and include it in this one. Redoy Bill. Okay. It's a good one. So what was the question? Best raised on your farm? <laughs> It can, no, be. it can be the I same just... answer, or you can now add to your ones that have been raised on. Your I was board. trying to eliminate the A team from the discussion. Thank you, Jesus. from Iowa, and allow somebody else to potentially say it. But now you can say it. Well, <laughs> it, 
there's a bunch of different deer, okay, with the 18. And it's that's the, and that's the point of the one word, one buck answer. The lightning round will be the longest part of this discussion today, gentlemen. <laughs> lightning round. Um, Fred's looking at all the mounts in his office. <laughs> um, is it is it Amos or Artie? Let's go back to Ace. Okay. Ace. Isn't isn't Artie just supercharged Ace? Super supercharged. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if you got if you guys haven't seen Ace uh, from from Fred, that's my opinion. Um, just a basic vibe by with big long brows, wide kind of flat out look, not overly large in his antler score or configuration. But if you if you look at Artie, he is just a monster version of ace like just he's just a bigger version of ace and you can if you put it on paper and look at that breeding um of his mom you can see exactly why um again that's my my description of what Artie is you know it's funny it's just it's like how did i pick ace well i never even thought about it when i said the original johnny buck ace's dad is a son of the original johnny buck mm. Ace's mom is a Redoy Jim Doe, which is Bill's dad. It's PA just, native. Like all, all you didn't know sudden, that you were such a fan of PA genetics, did you? <laughs> I just, <laughs> what it is, it happened. Yeah. But, uh, you know, here we are across the board, said those bucks, and then boom, there he has, you know, he has them in, has them in there, you know, so. I often, I have I often... to shy away from fleece, you know, we talked about fleece. Um, I was outpriced. I could not afford them deer. You know, they, they priced me out of the priced me out of the market. And so I had to do things other than that, you know? So, um, you want to look at Dean's deer, um, rim rock, rim rock is high rollers, full brother, uh, longer times, a lot longer times, but not as wide. It's hard to it's hard to look at Rimrock um, and put him in the conversation just because the amount of exposure that he got. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's. I I guess I'd be it'd be interesting to. Um, have some conversation about what if High Roller didn't have the opportunity to breed in Texas, right? Because yeah. there's just is it. It was it high rollers breeding and that exposure into those Texas deer that caused the hybrid vigor to make those offspring the way they were, or was he bred tightly enough and had enough production here in the north to make the comment that I did? Because like if you like, I think if you're honest and you you go down and you chat with those guys in Texas that used high roller. Um, like he just didn't miss down there, right? Like you, you go find those high roller does in the backside of, of those pedigrees. They're all, you know, most of them anyway, or five, six, seven, eight generations back now. But like those first F1 crosses out of him, whoa, like heavy, heavy duty, right? Like they just didn't miss. And I just, you know, like he, th that line's been totally unrelated pretty much from the stuff I used. I know Fred, you, you have some kind of interesting older, older girls like Ronnie, right? Like, yeah, that, that, yeah. you know, maybe go back into Oscar. Um, but like, for the most part, we don't, all of us here on the call don't really have the, the exposure to those old genetics. And by the time, you know, we were, I think we were kind of getting into it. The, those, those, those call them pure bond trigger does for whatever that means. Um, they were all diluted at that point. Um, they're still, they're still, well, they're all gone now pretty much, but um, it, it, it's, I just think he was, I think he was a, he was a special deer, certainly for his time. Um, he made a big impact on the, on the industry. Semen is this wonderful thing, you guys. Yeah. 
I mean, it is. And Dean, you know, I'm well, all the guys, all the guys way back in the 20s, 20s, 2000s, you know, were collecting semen on whatever they had because Roy Yoder showed them that they could make money on something that didn't cost them anything to produce. Um, so D, you go, I just pick on Dean. Uh, I loved the man, just loved him because it's just who, by who he was, you know. And you can pick deer out of his semen tank still that's a that's around and you can get the dan <clears throat> the dan weaver dough crossed with sundance so the dan weaver dough is is dean's very best dough and then sundance sundance's mom they always say it, if if you ever see it it's dean's good dough d, d g d is what they call her and um you know, he started with five doughs. He started with three doughs and a buck and then bought two more. That's when he bought the Dan Weaver dough, the two doughs from Dan Weaver. So that's where your hybrid vigor comes from is, is he never outcrossed. He had them deer. That's what it, you know, he paid 125 or I think $125 a piece for him and put him in uh, one of them chicken sheds, you know, raised it up. And that's where he's, and he just, he just did what he did. You know, they kept breeding each other and breeding each other and breeding each other. And then, so when you outcross that, you're going to have an explosion with, with, um, you know, the, 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 the South Texas deer that, you know, had their own inbreeding down there, line breeding before they brought Northern deer down there. So. Yeah. It's amazing when you look back at, at, um, you know, just 20, call it 25 years ago. Um, that the genetics from those days are, are still available today for us to use. Um, it just, w without technology, that wouldn't be possible. And, and here we are, given the tens of thousands of animals, hundreds of thousands of animals that have been produced from our industry today. And, and those animals are still relevant to the conversation of, of breeding. Um, you know, like, Dan, you mentioned uh, little boomer Redoy Bill, right? Nineties bucks. You, Jared, you mentioned Max Boat, like early two thousands. His dad is a ninety six born animal. Uh, Ace, you know, going back into the early nineties or, or excuse me, late nineties. Like it's just, it's incredible to to see those genetics um, be part of the conversation today, and and I, I think it speaks louder about the things that we were talking about before and the quality assessments that we can make of these animals, it's, it's easier to look back and look at the production of these older animals because they've had time to do it. And, and while it's, I'm not, I'm not discounting breeding new animals today. Um, but that, that kind of flavor of the month, um, can bite you. I think we've all experienced that, uh, to some degree because it's just, there's, it's not known. There's too many unknowns with, with newer bucks. Now it's easier to do when those bucks are on your farm and you're, you're live covering and you, you have the history and the knowledge from your own herd to make those decisions. But, um, I just think it's cool to look at the technologies that we have today and be able to look back all that time and, and still say, Hey, like this is a viable option for us. I, I bred with some, some straws that were over 20 years old, got lots of fawns from them, which I just, that's, that's mind blowing. I'll share the story with you. So somebody had, um, my wife was telling me a story. She had, she saw something that this baby human baby was born and it was, um, I think it was from the seventies. The embryos were frozen in the seventies or something like that. And it was like 40 some odd years old, uh, at the time. And it's just, it's amazing to think that, um, you know, it's like potential. It's older than me, right? Like I, I just, mm -hmm. it, it's nuts. Technically, it's older than me. Like when it was when it was created, uh, it's just wild to think about. And we have those, we have those things today. I, I, I wonder what things will look like in twenty more years. Um, you know what what types of genetics will be available? All right. So now that we're, we're on to the next, uh, you guys want to keep doing lightning rounds? Cause like you really got me thinking, okay. 
<laughs> Dan, right? Dan, that little shit, that little shit. Dan, he cost me some money on a on a charity auction the other day, getting <laughs> uh, getting some semen out of this particular buck. You got to name names. Uh, 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 Silver, Silver Bill. Silver Bill. Silver Bill. Bill. Excellent. It makes us silver bill silver bill oh we got it anyway all. so then this week this week dan didn't cost me any money because i found semen out of quick bill so silver bill is a bill son on a redoy bill son on a redoy bill daughter quick bill has redoy bill in the pedigree three times and then we're sitting here he says bill and just my mind just and then it's, all of a sudden it's like White 99 has Redoy Bill's mom. Love it's it. a different deer. Redoy Bill's mom. So all of a sudden, now we've got we got different ways to bring all of Bill's genetics, you know, most of Bill's genetics together. Because Freddie still has Redoy Jim semen in the tank. You know, it's just, it's, you know, if if a guy had the time, you know, you young if you had Freddie's going to cost me some money now. <laughs> the stuff you could remake, you know, or, or or do better, maybe do better with. I don't know, do better with. You know, the white ninety nine herd, um, all turned into all turned into Texas breeding. I mean, the damn things are so small. Um, the most crippled person you know can pick them up and throw them in a trailer. I mean, they're just that small, and um. Yeah, just it's just I I have got I have I have some comments about that breeding. So when you like, is it is it a testament to the strength of of Dina, right, that she was able to breed Redoy Mustang, and then create a fairly typical line because like the stuff i've seen out of white 99 generally and like i'm I'm kind of basing that on on kevin's breedings that he had with those that kind of first round of sons uh back in the day like they all had you know relatively good six by six frames they were kind of boxy they were very white 99 ish if you will mm -hmm. um mustang did not look like that at all no like no. he was the opposite like you if if mustang was in everybody's pens would be like no thank you right like nobody's breeding with him i'm not breeding with him anyway um yeah. but like how do you i mean how do you guys look at that like would you like what what is it about her that makes her special i mean obviously bill she did it twice right like very just like white 99 and, and redoy bill have similar characteristics they just do right the, yeah. bill is more well, upright Remember there was a white 100 or 101 or no. something. Yeah, there's a full brother. There was a full brother to white 99 that was bigger as a yearling. Semen got collected, but he died, and so white 99 was what was left. Hmm. So somewhere there's semen out of that. Well, you you could hope there's semen out of that uh, full brother to white 99. Maybe maybe better maybe you know has never been used um is maybe the word to say it's sitting in hawkeye somewhere somewhere yeah they're sitting somewhere. or interglobe or whatever yeah nice yeah. um i'm gonna open up the floor it's open discussion time you guys have any questions for each other before we uh we wrap up uh, as i was listening to you guys talk this is i don't even know if there's i'm not looking for an answer i guess i'm just curious um, talking about those older bucks and et cetera, the dope dose from the past, how many of those were planned and how many of those were just because of limited options and how, and, and I don't mean that like disrespectfully to anyone and then look what they've created because of, you know, we have so many options these days back then, Fred, maybe you can speak, no disrespect, you can speak better to this. There was less options, so when you see these 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 deer come out of these, it's kind of cool to watch see these deer come out of these programs. Not saying they weren't thought out, but how many of them just became because there was limited options that then they were created, and everybody's limited options started getting crossed, creating these 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 historically productive and and legendary deer per se. 
Go ahead, Josh. Um, I, I think like I, Fred mentioned the Johnny book, right? Like there's, there's certainly something that happened back then. I, I, I don't think there was much planning at all generally, right? Like there was very little planning. I think there were a few guys that had backgrounds in other animal industries that utilize that knowledge to their benefit to make some of these crosses. But like I, there, there were certainly breedings, many, many breedings that happened because people had a buck and some does in a pen or at that time, multiple bucks in, in pens with does. Like, I, I still remember seeing ad pages and people promoted this. They were like only using single sire breeding. And, and we're just like, what? Like, if you said that today, people would be like, I don't understand. Right. Okay. So like there was no DNA, like there was certainly guys that ran multiple breeder bucks in a pen with 20 does and like you got fawns. Hey, this, this is what they were. So planning way back when very limited. But there is there's a separate component, and you can call it whatever you want. There is there was something magical that happened back then. That, and I'll use I want to use the Johnny Buck because um, Fred mentioned it. The fact that that he that deer got crossed on those Patrick does to make that line which exists today that i don't know anybody that doesn't know it something there was a whole host of events that happened in the history of the deer world that made that happen we'll never know what it is we'll never be able to define it but it did happen um and like that is real our our history um and again you can call it whatever you want but something something happened there why it happened again we'll we'll never know but it's it's super cool to to know that it did and be able to use those genetics today i think that's just totally wild you know like i i uh i was able to get um direct offspring uh to use in my herd out of direct descendants of those animals this year they're 30 years old like it's wild right like it's just wild to think about that and you know a lot of people i think are i think a lot of folks in the industry have moved beyond that and they want you know 18 generations of pedigree on paper but like it, it doesn't it doesn't matter like the pet the pedigree is simply a, a snapshot of what happened in the past but it and and it's supposed to be used as a roadmap for really discerning breeders to use to their advantage to make appropriate decisions about the offspring that they want. But that's not what it's used for today. It, not, not in many cases, right? So like the pedigree doesn't matter. It does, but it doesn't, right? Like it's just supposed to help you with an informed decision. But I don't think a lot of people look at it like that. Um, I think they just see, you know, super doe, super doe, great buck, whatever. And they're like, oh, I, if I breed this, I'll get something good. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah. Well, I, I also think we, I'm, 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 com I'm continuing what you're saying, Josh. And I said this a little bit earlier, pretty much about myself in a sense of, I think there's a lot of confusion, at least the way I look at things at what a true deer breeder is and what just a, a, not just, but what a stalker producer is. Okay. And I know we all kind of mix some guy, you know, if you're, if you're a true breeder, in my opinion, you're also probably a stalker producer. Don't get me wrong. I think, I think that's there, but I think a lot of guys, are worried so much. And again, the breeder, the true breeder is trying to breed for true characteristics to improve animals. In my opinion, that there's a small group of those. And, and one for sure is on this call and they then there's the guys who just call themselves breeders but they're really not in my opinion improving the animal um they might be improving their auction sales they might be improving their popularity whatever you want to call it but i think i think it's important for guys listening to decide what you want to be um because I love listening to you guys talk about these old pedigrees. I love listening to you guys talk about like it, it, it. I enjoy it, but I don't anymore look that much in depth anymore at, at 
I mean, I look in depth. How do I? I'm not making my decisions that much in depth anymore. I'm trusting you, good breeders. You're not making them. You're not making them blindly either. You're not. You're not making your decisions blindly. You're no, looking. No, not at all. You're looking at the. Help me explain the, what I'm trying to say, Brett. Experience, Brett. you know, the experience that you see someone else has put in, and then you've been able to move forward with those. Maybe I'm. I'd like to add a that. little. I, I mean, I, I don't. I think this goes along with what we're saying, but I mean, I've gone, you know, back to some of these older, older breeders and older genetics and stuff that I can get because of some of the deer that I've raised out of them, and I don't necessarily like the characteristics of some of the animals that have that have been produced by them in newer days, but I like the characteristics that were produced by them years ago, you know, and that kind of, that's kind of the look that I'm going for, you know, I'm, you know, some of the, the older deer have more of the look that I like more of the classic look. They might not be the biggest, they might not be the mar most marketable, but you know, for me, I'm breeding deer that I want to look at in hopes that other people like the same characteristics that I like. And these older deer to me just, you know, they, they seem to, uh, they seem to, to produce that more than some of the, uh, outcrossed or, you know, they breed true, I, true to form. Dan, I, Dan, I think you and I are in the same boat. Um, we're still looking for marketability in our deer. We just have a different clientele and ours hmm. is sitting in a hunting blind next to us, you know? Yep. Yeah. I, yeah, I, gotta... I mean, I've, oh, yeah, go, go, go ahead, ahead, Fred. No, you go ahead. No, no, no. You first. I got a question. Uh, speed round. One word. <laughs> one thought. I love it. What has changed the industry the most in the in the time that you've uh, raised deer? What has changed the industry the most? I get to go first. Um, For better or worse, or it doesn't matter. No, no, it doesn't. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um. So I haven't said this yet, and I have said it on every show for about 50 shows. Uh, it's an acronym. It's my favorite thing. It's called CWD. I was obviously saying that it's CWD being my favorite thing uh, with a great deal of disdain and sarcasm for those listening who can't see the expressions on my face. Um, and we are going to talk about that next. So CWD. World yeah. Records. I like that. That's good. Yeah. yeah. The internet. The internet. <laughs> well, that's right. Good. That's amazing. I mean, look at all these. I mean, they're just, it's, remember the days when you travel to farms and look at the animal in person and, you know, you, you make your relationships and you see the confirmation and you see, you know, nowadays on the internet, you see fancy ad pages and marketability and this, that, or, I mean, I, I think, yeah, the internet. There was nothing like opening your mailbox getting 35 millimeter photos in the mail that you had talked on the phone with or wrote a letter to somebody and requested and then open it up and be like, Oh wow. Look at this buck. Right. Like I still remember doing that. Cause like there was no email, there was no YouTube, there was no Facebook, like there was no Google, there was nothing. It was nothing. I still love some of the letters I get from some of my Amish friend breeders that, mail me pictures of the bucks it's i still uh, appreciate that a lot no doubt what's yours fred uh top 30 auction excellent um that was the shortest lightning round ever fred um from now on you're going to be in charge of lightning round questions because obviously no one liked mine <laughs> <laughs> um but i i do i we we would be remiss if we didn't discuss CWD, um, just given how it affects our industry uh, generally, not only from a regulatory standpoint, from a health standpoint, um, but now also a breeding standpoint. And uh, I'd like to just have an open discussion on on what that looks like for, for you guys, maybe on an uh, individualized basis. And then also have a discussion how you, you all think it affects the industry as a whole. Um, I am going to just step out for a second and uh, use the restroom, excuse me, and, and I'll be back. So lead away. The CWD. 
We're going to stay quiet for the next 30 minutes while he's still in the bathroom. I have to edit this out. Yeah. So the, the guy uh, says, says CWD and then leaves. Yeah. You know, I, ha- I have seen so much, you guys. So CWD started in the 67 or whatever year out in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I, and I used to do a lot of raising a lot of exotic stuff, but I've had deer forever, you know, forever. And I was at the Lolly Brothers uh, exotic animal auction in Macon, Missouri, a million years ago. And there was discussion out on the porch of the sale barn about this disease in Colorado that's going to affect, at that time, mostly the elk industry. Um, but, and everybody looked around like, what are you guys talking about? Because there were guys from out, out west would come bring their animals to the Midwest to sell at, at that auction. It was, you know, it's a huge auction. And, and I don't even know if it had the acronym, you know, the CWD word yet. It was just a disease out there that's going to affect the industry. And yeah, everybody looked around like, it's not going to affect me. It's too far away. Colorado's forever away. And, and lo and behold, you know, 2001, um, it's spread across this country faster than you'd ever imagine. My question has always been, has it spread or has it always been here? You know, um, how, you know, it gets, it got so many places so fast and I really don't believe, I mean, I know the industry has now moved it around, but back in the seventies and eighties, you know, 60, seventies and eighties, we did not move that many deer around the country. Um, to have moved the disease uh, like it has, you know, the patchwork that it first started out. Um, I think I think researchers moved this disease. Researchers in zoos moved this disease way more than early on. Uh, were the main the main things that moved it around, and and are possibly are uh, is what's what's moved us forward to, you know, having to look at, um, uh, genetic resistance. Um, that's, that's our, that's our most valid available way to move forward with the industry. You know, it's, it's, but it, I think it moved across the country way faster than it should have, um, because of the way the sales were at that time. It just, it just wasn't, there weren't, people moving deer like they, you know, like they were in the heydays, you know, back in the early 2000s. So it's just, it's just curious how how it moved so far. To your first point, Fred, I remember dad and I beginning, uh, well, dad bought this property I'm on now in 2004. I started, we did some timber work, started clearing land and put our first post in the ground in 2009. And I could drive, now, no, I'm, I'm, this is all hindsight. I could, I could drive from our location now less than three hours to Maryland where there was known disease. And in my mind back then, it might as well have been in California. And it was only three hours away. And I think that was the mentality of many of us. Like, and then three, four, sh- three years, short years later, um, you know, we, we, we discovered it, let's call it, that it was in Pennsylvania. And, um, and then, you know, everybody's worlds have changed but it changed our world um going to the on the farm basis um for me it's just been management and getting lucky to still i mean i literally got a client i still literally got in a session for cwd test while we were on this phone come through my email um uh still not detected and i guess i've looked at it from an on the farm basis management or personally on the farm trying to keep the disease away has been management and luck and we can all agree or disagree and and it's been like trying to add layers of protection to just not test positive um two main things for me and and my belief is i uh, we worked hard to double fence our breeding facility and really stopped moving animals into the facility as, as much as we can i know that's not an option for everybody 
Um, and now the third layer of protection, I guess, I guess bringing animals in and, and double fencing that. So let's umbrella that under biosecurity in some sense. Um, and now genetics is trying to add another layer of protection to not test positive for the disease. Um, it changed my whole world as it did. I know many of us, but like, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I could move breeding stock, but my, my mark, my markets for the quote unquote breeding side of the world are selling live animals off of my facility disappeared overnight. Um, maybe a blessing in disguise in some ways, as far as how I approached my, my breeding herd in some ways. And our focus always was the hunting ranch. So I, I had to just be forced to even more zone in on that focus and, and not even think about the live animal sales off the farm. Um, but at this point now, it's just it's it's trying to not test positive and work on regulation that when we do test positive, there's still a pathway to, um, you know, to, to stay in business and move forward with the disease because it's it's inevitable. It's 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 in my world. It's been a mile and a half from my driveway since 2013. So I'm going on. I mean, it's been we, we have a big chunk of property here. It's been on, it's it's we haven't tested it on our animals, but it's for sure been in the environment for sure. And it's, it's a mile and a half down the road since 2013. So I'm in 11 years of, uh, dodging the bullet. Um, but it, uh, it, it changed, it changed my world and changed a lot of people's world. I'm not this County. I'm not trying to be selfish on that end. Um, this County, three, four counties within our state, you know, guys lost their markets, not overnight, but essentially overnight in, in a couple of years, they were gone. Um, and trying to survive in that, environment is difficult especially if you don't have a hunting outlet of your own um so i don't know where i'm heading with that but for me it's it's my when it comes to cwd and my thoughts it's it's management on the farm how can i use the best management practices that i can come up with or that i can think of or others can help me come up with to keep it off my farm and then when it does working with guys like josh and guys in our state and guys nationally like you uh, the two Dan and, and Fred to create a regulatory environment that allows us to manage through it and research to help us manage through it. I think that's, that's how I look at CWD these days. I, I, I there's so much more to bitch or sorry, complain about. Um, but the, the reality is try to keep it off the farm and create regulations to allow us to operate once it, once it does hit the farm Go our facility, however you want to look at it. Uh, I'm back. <clears throat> so, uh, I didn't, Dan, did you, did you speak already on this? You have some no. commentary you'd like to provide us? Um, cause you're in I a mean, different place, be... right? Like New York's a different, much different than Iowa and Pennsylvania and how they, they look at this. It's actually kind of unique. It has a unique, uh, history just given, uh, where it was with a you know a, a wild finding, if you will, and where it sits today. Yeah, I mean here in New York, you know, we we did have uh, the discovery of CWD in two thousand and five, um, and they you know did some eradication programs and whatnot in the area, and and you know we haven't had uh, any uh, positive cases since, and you know the the state feels that they you know were able to eradicate the disease out of uh, the state. Um, for us personally, you know, our, our exposure, you know, when, when I first started the farm, you know, we kind of, we started with, uh, nine does and two bucks. And, you know, when, when New York decided to do the, um, you know, the close, to close the borders for anything coming in, you know, I kind of sealed up my farm at the same time. And I've done all of our work through artificial insemination and just keeping the exposure level uh, as low as possible. Um, we also, you know, try to pay attention to, I mean, to some point uh, uh, on our biosecurity and, and choosing, you know, what we bring in um, as far as, you know, outside, you know, I, I've always wanted to bring in, you know, Western alfalfa or something. And, and I just haven't, you know, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know that it, would or would not increase the exposure level or not but uh you know we've we've tried to produce what we can locally here uh and you know 
my brother and I do, you know, so we make a lot of our own hay and things that we feed. But then again, you know, we are buying commercial, uh, commercial grains. So, um, but I mean, keeping the closed herd and, and not, you know, not selling, we don't sell live animals to other breeders really. Uh, so we keep our exposure level low there as well. And, you know, the hunting ranch, we bring our animals to the hunting ranch and, you know, they get shot, tested, things are clean uh, so far. But it's not to say that it's it's not here or it's not coming. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. And hopefully we can, you know, develop some practices here in our state that would allow us to continue to do business if we do pop positive. So, you know, being with the regulations and, and trying to get ahead of the curve with some of the genetic breeding is definitely, um, it's definitely a focus. Yeah. It's interesting. I think when you look at uh, CWD, there's really, there's kind of two components to it. You have one, the disease itself and the, the implications uh, that it brings as far as the, the health concern. And then um, you have that regulatory environment. And I feel like we're, we as an industry are, are consistently uh, discounting the health concerns and um, focusing on the regulation and for good reason, right? Like there, everybody on this call and, and I would, I would assume the overwhelming majority of those listening I have to deal with that regulatory environment on a consistent basis, like every day, right? Like you have an animal die on your farm. Guess what? It's got to be CWD tested. You have to fill out inventory. You have to make sure that the, the tags and the microchips and the RFIDs are all appropriate and matching. And, and those are submitted to the state and so on and so forth. Um, but I do feel like um, that we are at a point in history where, the technologies be, because of the amount of research that's being done that the technologies that are coming online available to us uh, poise us to be in a position that we've never been in before as an industry and really be at the forefront of true cwd management right like we can implement um all sorts of different uh, strategies from biosecurity to uh, live diagnostics to uh, environmental diagnostics, to genomic breeding, and all these coupled in different areas of the state really put us at the forefront to change the narrative and the dynamic of CWD in North America. And, and we're, we're going to, my opinion, we're going to be the model for everyone else to look at. Um, I, I am trying to look at my operation and make decisions today that I think will have implications in 10, 15, 20 years, right? Like I am, I am not looking at next year as I'm going to fix this problem. Um, mm. and, and when I say problem, I don't, I don't mean like necessarily directly in my pen. I mean, on the landscape here in Pennsylvania or in other States that need help. And that, that, um, specifically that genetic reservoir that I am creating um, is not necessarily for me, right? It's for others. And, and I hope that many of us can look at CWD, take a step back, look at CWD in a, in a kind of big picture and say, Hey, like we really have an opportunity to do so much good um, through what we, we love and, and we, we cherish, right. And that's breeding white-tailed deer. Um, so I hope everybody can, and can look at that and, and take a piece out of that, that statement and just say, Hey, like, I, I, I think that that's a, a good opportunity for us to do some good in the world. Right. Like I was listening to a, a quote and the guy was talking about why he was on this planet or something poetic. And he just said, you know, like, I'm here to serve, right? Like I, like, how can I be of service to, to others and, and our interactions just much like this one today, um, you know, they serve a, they serve a benefit. Of course, we're, we're, I think we're all getting some personal enjoyment from the conversation, but, um, there's, there's information that, that we all have that we can share and, and that can be of service to others. So, um, anyway, back to the CWD thing. I, I, I think that all those, those things that I mentioned 
are really important. And I, I hope that we as an industry continue to develop our thoughts and ideas about not only implementing those things, but how we communicate to others about them. Because I, I do think that we, we, we have been as an industry stigmatized around our role in CWD. And I think, I think Fred touched on kind of a, an important point with how CWD was moved around, um, you know, kind of prior to the quote unquote boom in our industry. And um, it's just something we have to deal with today, right? Like we're it, like our bed's been made. Like we, we, we need to, we need to um, figure out what to do with it. So. I, I just saw a, Oh, research clip on a mule deer doe that was a migratory doe, one that moved mm -hmm. 270 miles oh. each yes, way. Sir. Each That's way? Idea. Each way. Was she in yeah. Wyoming or what? Yeah, out, yeah, out west. And she just started, you know, and it was, I don't know if it was three years or four years they had her collared, and she would just start moving south turn around and fawn someplace and keep moving south and then turn around and, and go back and went back to the exact same places year after year, you know, twice, twice a year. She moved that far just on the go, the, the whole, you know, just a grazer, you know? So then you wonder how, you know, I always wondered how it got to New Mexico because no deer farms in New Mexico, no research, no nothing's in New Mexico. And, boom, there it is in the mule deer. It's like somebody walked down the canyon or the side of the mountain, you know, and just kept on walking. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I think a big I, part of a CWD yeah. is, is, is education and research, you know, trying to develop, you know, trying to learn more about it and, and figure out how to benefit, you know, use it as a, as a benefit for the animal. You know, nobody wants, nobody wants sick animals. Nobody wants, none of us producers want, want that. And, uh, you know, the more we can learn about it and the more that we can do to make the animal better, um, it's just going to be, it's just going to be better, not just for our industry and our farms, but for the animal itself. I think deer farmers need to take more pride in the research being done with CWD. You know, we look, okay, we talked about the regulatory and how that is, that's what beats us in the head every day is the regulations. But we need to look at, at how proud we should be at the, at the things that we have learned or the, the world has learned about CWD because we raise white-tailed deer. You know, we have, we are, we have samples and herds that, that they can look at the statistics and know how it's spread through the herd, the length of time that it's been in the herd, and that the wild deer, you know, the wild deer can't give that information, you know. We're able to put together um, all the uh, uh, different codons, you know, and put those into a research, research facility out here in Iowa to look at the resistance of the different codons. Um, you know, we're able to give uh, Dr. Seabury, we, the, the, the industry, Dr. Seabury samples, even though they came through the USDA, they came from deer farms, you know, to, to figure out the, um, the genetic breeding values. Um, and that's all stuff that we did, you know, the positive stuff that we did, that the conservation departments, the, the, the Department of you know, of agriculture's just ha can't do without us. Even though they want to point the finger at us, we are going to fix the problem as well. You know, it's 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 us. It's the producers. It's it's uh, three of you guys. All four of us, I think, have gone to D.C. Uh, lobbying for money uh, to continue research. You know, to make sure they know that we're that the industry and and white-tailed deer are very important to us both in the wild and in the pens you know and that's that's the things that have made a difference so that we've gotten the funds and and the opportunities to do the research that's that's been going on um i um i like that message fred and and um i think that we're going to wrap up on that positive note and that's having pride in our animals and 
and in what we do in our industry. Um, I like that a bunch. I, I, I haven't heard it put exactly like that. And, and I certainly appreciate that. And, um, I feel emboldened by that statement that we're, we're doing something good. So, um, anyway, I appreciate everybody, uh, joining me for this hundredth episode. It's always good to hang out. I actually, um, I really like this format a bunch because I talk to each of you individually from time to time. And we have these conversations, um, you know, on a person to person basis, but I think having everybody in the, in the same virtual room, if you will, has been really good. And I, uh, I appreciate each one of you, uh, for what you do for not only the industry, but our, uh, our relationship that, that we have. So thank you all for that. Can I, can I add one thing? Uh, it, it has to be lightning round short, Fred, lightning round and your lightning. I'd like, to do this. I'd like to do this again. Yes. I want you to supply the cigars and the shot of whiskey so we can celebrate at the end. Okay. Um, I will ship cigars to each one of you and we'll get in our respective um, designated uh, smoking areas and we'll have a cigar. And uh, for those of us that don't drink whiskey like myself um, or, or guys like me who shouldn't drink whiskey like myself, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll have a, I'll have a beer or, or two or seven uh, with you guys and, and we'll, we'll see if the uh, uh, PG rating can maintain itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a hell of a lightning round. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, guys, I appreciate it. With that, uh, stay I tuned. Appreciate you all as well. Stay Every tuned day, for another episode of North American Deer Talk. <laughs> <laughs>